I'm Matt Galski. I'm a professor of medicine at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. I'm a medical oncologist, and I focus on the care of patients with urothelial cancer. So this study included patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer that was clinically localized. So clinical T2 uh, to T4A N0 M0 urothelial cancer of the bladder. We've known for some time that a subset of patients treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy for clinically localized muscle invasive bladder cancer will achieve a pathological complete response to treatment. And of course, if we knew that before patients had their bladder removed, we could potentially offer those patients a bladder sparing path. Uh, potentially, patients could be cured with TURBT plus systemic therapy alone. One of the challenges in this space is defining a pathologic complete response without removing the bladder. And it's been said that clinical of response or clinical staging and pathological staging are disconnected. And that's certainly uh, at the case. That said, clinical staging has not been consistently defined historically. And if we're treating clinical staging as a biomarker in terms of making treatment decisions, we need to develop it as rigorously as one would develop any biomarker. We need to define it consistently we need to test it consistently. So in this study, after patients underwent four cycles of gemcitabine, cisplatin, plus the PD-1 inhibitor of nivolumab, each patient underwent an MRI of the bladder, unless they had a contraindication, then they underwent a CAT scan, a cystoscopy with biopsies of any visible lesions, or biopsies of the prior scar site uh, in biopsies from selected areas in the bladder if there was no visible evidence of tumor, and urine cytology as well. So mapping biopsies, urine cytology, and imaging of the bladder. And if all of those tests were normal, that was considered a clinical complete response. And those patients were offered the opportunity to not have their bladders removed and undergo an additional four months of nivolumab alone. The study included co-primary endpoints. Because clinical restaging has not been consistently and rigorously defined, one of our endpoints was to determine what the clinical complete response rate was to treatment based on these parameters, based on our assessment of clinical response. The second co-primary endpoint, though, was to determine the performance characteristics of a complete clinical response in terms of predicting a long-term benefit. Really, we want to know, does clinical complete response identify patients who can remain long-term uh, disease-free with an intact bladder? Again, if we're treating clinical restaging as a biomarker, we want to define the performance characteristics of that biomarker as defined rigorously. So 76 patients were enrolled to this study. At the time of the data lock, 64 patients had reached the point of clinical restaging, and so that was our data set for this preliminary analysis. 31 patients achieved a clinical complete response, so the clinical complete response rate to treatment was 48%. The co-primary endpoint of treatment benefit, whether or not clinical complete response predicts treatment benefit, had to be a, a composite endpoint because patients with a clinical complete response were offered the opportunity to not undergo cystectomy, but they could opt to undergo cystectomy. So we had to define treatment benefit as a composite endpoint of being two years metastasis-free if patients opted for no cystectomy or a pathological complete response if they opted to have cystectomy immediately. Now, only one patient who had a clinical complete response decided to have a cystectomy right away. And so that speaks a little bit to the uh, enthusiasm for the patients who opted to enroll on the trial in terms of trying to maintain their bladders intact. Um, of the remaining 30 patients, we have a follow-up of about one year. And so we don't have mature follow-up to define this two-year metastasis-free endpoint yet. Um, however, I can tell you that 
we do have of the patients who are past one year from the start of treatment who had a clinical complete response and who opted to have their bladders remain intact, uh, 12 of uh, uh, 18 patients uh, have a bladder intact and no evidence of recurrence. Um, so we know that this can be achieved in a subset of patients, but of course, long-term follow-up is really necessary to determine the stability of those results and to determine if those patients remain disease-free with a bladder intact long-term. Enrolling to bladder cancer clinical trials has been historically difficult. Uh, it's, it's been a challenge in the field historically that's been raised uh, consistently over the years. That's been less the case in the past five to 10 years, possibly in part uh, based on patient advocacy, partially in part based on industry interest in, in, in this disease uh, based on the development of new therapeutics. That said, um, this particular disease state um, in uh, this particular question we were very surprised at how quickly this trial accrued. Um, one of the few trials that I've been with, uh, in, involved with in the past several years that enrolled at a much quicker rate than was projected. And I think that does speak to the, again, interest and enthusiasm uh, from the patient side in terms of seeking treatment approaches that might allow them to uh, retain their bladders. I think it's important to recognize two aspects of this, uh, of this trial and this approach. One is that uh, the follow-up is not mature. We need long-term data from this study to really understand the true implications of this approach. Um, and, and so it's not ready for prime time. There's a number of other studies testing similar approaches in terms of systemic therapy plus TURBT uh, to try and achieve uh, bladder sparing. Uh, and a culmination of all of these studies, I think, will help to determine whether or not uh, this approach should be integrated into standard treatment pathways. Thank you.